This is the CIA headquarters at Langley, Virginia. 20 minutes east is the White House, and 70 minutes southwest lies the SWIFT data center, which logs its global cross-border transactions. The proximity of these sites is no coincidence. Since 1944, American financial power has been a key geopolitical weapon. Here, the main component is the US dollar. Vital commodities including hydrocarbons and precious metals are priced in dollars. And by controlling global money flows and overseeing one quadrillion dollars of annual international transactions, Washington can freeze out its enemies via unilateral sanctions. And that is precisely the problem. Nowadays, many states see dollar hegemony as a relic of American primacy and seek to develop alternative financial infrastructures. Most are centered around China, the only economy large enough to counterbalance the United States. De-dollarization is fast expanding via bilateral, multilateral and institutional arrangements. China is looking to undo the nature of the dollar matrix, because in geopolitics you don't want to depend too much on others. Even your shadow will abandon you when in the dark. China is striking deals left and right. It is using BRICS to ditch the US dollar. But you might not have heard much about it depending on where you get your news. For instance, China and Brazil have recently reached a deal to trade in their own currencies. Using Ground News, the sponsor of today's video, I can see who's reporting on this story and compare coverage across the political spectrum with access to international perspectives that are hard to find. Interestingly, the de-dollarization is spearheaded by former Brazilian president Dilma Rousseff. Nowadays, she is the chair of the New Development Bank, which looks to provide one-third of loans in local currencies. Already, 19 states are looking to join the program. This story is huge, but only right-leaning sources are covering it, making it a blind spot for left-leaning media. Once you start reading the news this way, it's impossible to go back. Try it out at ground.news slash Caspian. You can subscribe through my link to get 30% off unlimited access for as little as $5 a month. Money is the power to command others. As a social institution, money was historically tied to precious metals. But since coinage was liable to clipping, wearing and debasement, its social power derived not from its metal content, but from the state whose mark it bore. In an anarchic global system though, there can be no world state. And since monetary systems are inherently national, global money regimes reflect the interests of the currency issue great powers. Since 1944, monetary power has centered in the United States. With Western Europe in tatters and Eastern Europe falling behind the Iron Curtain, Washington used creditor power to pry open Britain and France's imperial trading blocks. Post-war reconstruction loans were predicated on importing American food and manufacturers and granting Washington veto power at lending institutions, including the IMF and the World Bank. A system of fixed exchange rates, convertible with gold, held everything in place. But while Washington initially enjoyed a major trade surplus, NATO expenditure and military buildups in Korea and Vietnam dragged its international payments into the red. By 1964, America's payments deficit was due solely to overseas military spending. But the formation of vested interests and the insistence that such outlays were vital to national security prevented Washington from pulling the plug. As American allies exchanged their dollars for gold, convertibility became unstuck. Soon thereafter, the volume of circulating dollars exceeded the legal limit of four times Washington's gold stock. And after exhausting every expedient available to keep convertibility afloat, in August 1971, 
the Nixon administration abandoned gold and devalued the dollar by 10%. In doing so, Washington stumbled upon a geopolitical masterstroke. Foreign central banks could no longer check the United States by exchanging dollars for gold, but nor could they repudiate the dollar's legitimacy. Doing so would render their vast dollar holdings worthless. And since American corporate stocks were too risky and its real estate too illiquid, foreign central bankers' only option was to recycle their dollars into interest-bearing US Treasury securities. Failure to do so would have also caused a dollar oversupply, granting American firms a competitive devaluation against European industry. Washington's allies thus had no choice but to accept dollar hegemony. The dollar had become the world's problem. Untethered from gold, Washington pursued overseas military spending without constraint. Dollars sent overseas would be exchanged for local currency, flowing into foreign central banks and cycling back to the United States as treasury bill purchases. There was no theoretical limit to this new circular flow. Effectively, the perpetual rollover of American debt acted as a military subsidy. American strategists could encircle Russia and China with 800 military bases knowing the money spent would boomerang home. All while, fear of an international monetary breakdown prevented other states from calling America's bluff. The United States' debtor status thus cemented American power, and its dollar-making capacity excluded it from the austerity rules it applied to other dollar-debted states via the IMF and the World Bank. A 1974 deal with Saudi Arabia bolstered this power further. Riyadh would sell oil in dollars and recycle the proceeds into US treasuries. Combined with American agricultural dominance, this meant unilateral dollar sanctions could strangle hostile powers from food and energy imports. Naturally, geopolitical rivals saw this system as inequitable, instead pushing for a new international economic order despite lacking the hard power to pursue it. Ironically though, it were American businesses that made de-dollarization possible when they offshored their production to China in search of lower wages. Mistaking money for national wealth, Washington saw profit rates increase, but the real wealth of nations is their productive capacity, and as North America de-industrialized Washington's growing import dependency and China's industrial development became a geopolitical friction point. Beijing also grew wary of funding its own encirclement via the Treasury Bill Standard, but its exposure to the dollar system kept it in an uneasy balance, not least due to its holding of $1 trillion of American debt. Instead, it was China's partners who provided the catalyst for de-dollarization. Since 2000, American sanctions designations have increased by 900%, escalating following Russia's annexation of Crimea and expanding to Chinese technology firms like Huawei. Initially, most major economies swallowed these measures, but freezing Iranian, Venezuelan and Afghan sovereign assets pushed the envelope. And in 2022, the tipping point came when Washington seized $300 billion in Russian assets and suggested revising US law to disperse the funds for Ukraine's reconstruction. This decision, more than any other, ended dollar hegemony. Though Washington may dislike Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the hard fact is countries will not bank with a state that seizes foreign assets. A modicum of trust, even between enemies, is needed. This trust is now gone. And since many predict a Chinese-American conflict soon, Beijing's belated de-dollarization efforts are designed to avoid Russia-style sanctions. 
Thus, for now, bilateral and multilateral deal makings allow China to manage its dollar decoupling while providing states like Russia and Iran with an economic lifeline. This has given many smaller states the green light to follow suit, a fact acknowledged even by the US Treasury. Central bank dollar reserves are proportionally declining while Russia, China, India and the EU are building swift alternatives like SPFS, CIPS, INSTEX and SFMS. For example, Beijing has struck a currency swap deal with Argentina worth 130 billion yuan, which is about 19 billion dollars. This freezes up the latter's dollars to service its IMF debts. Meanwhile, China has brokered a deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which gives it the diplomatic heft to match its buying power as the world's top oil and petrochemical importer. Riyadh is now considering selling oil in Chinese currency, while Qatar has already settled gas purchases in Yuan. Over time, such arrangements could spread through groupings like OPEC and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. The former accounts for roughly 44% of global oil production, and the latter accounts for one-fifth of global GDP. But the most significant grouping is BRICS, containing two-fifths of the world's population, one-quarter of its GDP, and 16% of its commerce. BRICS also happens to be openly committed to de-dollarization. The China-Brazil nexus is especially important. Brazil's commodity producer status meant it conducted over $150 billion of trade with China in 2022. And in March 2023, the two countries agreed to trade in local currencies. They plan to employ the new development bank to provide one-third of loans in local currencies, facilitating more manageable debt repayments. It's the most ambitious de-dollarization program yet, and already, 19 states are looking to join BRICS, including Argentina, Egypt and Indonesia. Other developments like central bank digital currencies could create parallel payments networks independent of dollar influence. But as a stopgap measure, gold will likely form an expedient. Beijing has currently begun moving away from treasury bill purchases and towards building its gold stock accumulating more than 1,800 tons by April 2023. The emphasis on gold hints at something more general. China regulates credit as public utility, deploying it selectively for development, political and strategic objectives. Flooding the world with Yuan would make Chinese policy hostage to competing priorities, something Beijing will not countenance. So, while the prevalence of the yuan will chip away at the dollar, it will not replace it as the world's money. Currency orders reflect the balance of power. Multipolarity is already here, and multipolar currency regimes are not far off. The US dollar is not going anywhere, but its exorbitant privilege is winding down. This will blunt its use as an economic weapon and shift America's military spending burden onto its tax base. Steady de-dollarization will have ripple effects far and wide. Chinese President Xi Jinping said it best. Right now there are changes, the likes of which we haven't seen for 100 years. I've been your host Chirvan from Caspian Report. If you want access to additional content, think of PDFs, copyright-free mapping, etc., check out our Patreon page. The link for it will be in the description. For now, thank you for watching and Sagol.